Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for blade lovers to learn about knives and hear from the makers, manufacturers, and reviewers that make the knife world go round. I'm Bob DeMarco, and coming up, ZT retreads another knife, this time a Sinkovich. I get out, I get the Steel City Cutlery Fang Custom in my hands, which is pretty sweet, and the meanest fixed blades on the block. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome back to the show. You know, I talk so much here all week, every week, but you have a comment section below to talk back. And I do read those comments and uh, I love each and every one, almost each and every one of them. Uh, but this is my favorite this week. The eternal question. Now, this comes from Top Dog 8762. And this is on last week's midweek, uh, midweek supplemental. And he says, the eternal question to box or not to box. I say, always save your box. Put them all in bigger boxes. Eventually, you'll have enough to make furniture out of them. Stand alone and they can be end tables and coffee tables. Gather enough together, tie them up and throw a pillow on them and bam you've got a couch always save the box i love it i love it these are some practical things you can do with the boxes of boxes that you have i have a couple of boxes of boxes around here uh, but i gotta say uh, at the core of it all is save your box because you never know if you're gonna actually sell that knife that you cannot do without it happens and then you sell it and then you don't miss it that does happen too I need to remind myself of that uh, that lesson right there. Anyway, uh, Top Dog 8762, thanks for the comment. I loved it. All right, a pocket check. What are we carrying this week or on this day? Uh, but you'll leave your pocket check below in the comments. Uh, always like to know what people are carrying because it helps me kind of see what else is out there. Easy to get locked into your own echo chamber. All right, so here we go. Today in my front right pocket, I had the awesome off-grid knives xl cayman off-grid knives makes or designs really fantastic uh flippers they're all flippers i realized uh folder uh folding knives and outdoor fixed blades uh this design this dramatic clip point design that actually does look a bit like a cayman a, a smaller crocodilian uh, type animal creature from uh, Brazil and South America. This does look like a Cayman snout, uh, but a dramatic clip point blade. I love clip point blades. And Off Grid Knives has all of their stuff manufactured by Best Tech. And Best Tech, man, they are just about my favorite OEM. Uh, I have a lot of stuff made by them, some from their own label and some as OEM work as it is with off-grid knives and everything I have by them is outstanding. So I'm, I'm really into best tech, uh, as an, as a uh, company, as a manufacturer, and I'm really into off-grid knives as a designer. So put them together and you have something outstanding. Uh, off-grid knives are really excellent at cutting cardboard. I gotta say, so that means like a lot of utility tasks that require slicing, thin, thin, sharp blades that slip through material. Uh, even though this looks big and beefy, which it is, it's very slender uh, in the blade and very, very sharp. So this is a, a capable EDC knife as well as a kind of a menacing big knife. This is the XL and it's a four inch blade. Uh, originally the EDC, the first one that came out, the Cayman EDC uh, came in at uh, 3.125, you know, three and a quarter inches great knife. I have that. That's one of my favorite three and a quarter inch blade bladed knives. And then when they came out with the uh, XL, I lost it. And uh, man, I love it. That four inch blade is really my wheelhouse, my original wheelhouse back from the first uh, cold steel folder days when everything, well, the early tactical knife days, everything was four inch blades. And that always kind of stuck with me, like wearing boot cut jeans from the nineties, you know, because I was born in the seventies and they say every 20 years, all right, you get it. All right, so the Cayman Off-Grid XL was in my front right pocket, my front left pocket today. Uh, nothing new in terms of, uh, I've been carrying this thing nonstop, but it is a new knife. It just dropped on the 15th of July. This is the um, 
sorry, uh, the Jack Wolf Knives Midnight Jack. It's a coffin handle jack, so appropriately named Midnight, you know, when the ghouls uh, prowl the prowl the graveyards and and open the caskets. Well, you got that graveyard or that um, coffin shaped handle, which you see oftentimes on uh, Bowie knives. I love that. It's a very neutral shape, very comfortable in hand. Uh, these sort of cuts at the end, these facets at the end really make for a comfortable, uh, you know, nestling in the in the uh, in the hand there. And of course, these are um, designed by Ben Belkin, who is a, you know, man, he's a connoisseur of custom slip joint knives and uh, low, low number production model slip joint knives and distilled all of his expertise and taste into these designs and had them produced to the most incredible standards. This has a full height hollow grind as do all of them. And it is very, very, very sharp and very thin. I use this. There's still some gunk on it. I need to remove. I use this to slip. Uh, I slip that blade between a label, a shipping label and a cardboard box and just kind of cut through the adhesive. It's so thin. It did that. It didn't mar the uh, label and it didn't mar the it. That's not true. I kind of cut into the label a couple of times, but it did not mar the cardboard at all. It just slipped between them. It's so thin, so sharp. Um, yeah, love these uh, Jack Wolf knives. But listen to this. Amazing walk and talk. If you're driving, you better pull over, you know. Man, that walk and talk is something. All right. So uh, Midnight Jack in my front left pocket. I'm still waiting for these. Um, I shouldn't say waiting, uh, but the slips are stout leather. And I love how leather looks once it patinas like my um, like my wallet and that kind of thing. Or or my old slip uh, slip joint cases that get really shiny and molded to the knife. I look forward to that happening with each one of my uh, Jack Wolf knives, but I don't carry any one in particular enough yet for that to happen. I'm I'm kind of rotating through them quite a bit. Okay, uh, last up today um, in my pocket was the QSP Penguin, and this thing, um, man, I I do love this knife, and it was one of those ones. I'm a late adopter, you know, uh, and and this is definitely one of those knives that uh, I didn't go for for a long time, and I was like, you know, I'm not. I like Warren Cliff's sheep sheep foots. Sheep's foots are mm, not as desirable to me because of the points. This one does have a nice point, though. This was the first knife I ever knew of with denim micarta, so that was the original draw. Um, I always say that the denim on this reminds me of the overalls that a, a, an engineer of a train would wear. Um, very nice grip on this. Very nice action to this QSP Penguin. It's like a... reminds me of a rat, like a rat too in the way it deploys it's on washers but super smooth and you just it just flicks out really nicely you've got a deep carry um pocket clip but with the domed screws you know that's at this point that's that's a jailable offense so we're gonna have to get after qsp for that you know i i imagine after every knife is sold without uh, every knife is sold with the with the domed screws in the deep carry pocket clips everyone is just going to go to the inset clip with the flathead screw so they can just stop hearing us talk about it. Uh, this one is in D2. They make so many different versions of the QSP Penguin. And I saw recently there's a beautiful titanium frame locked with jigging on the titanium uh, sides, show sides and lock sides. And they are an exclusive from dot, dot, dot. Google it. I can't remember. Uh, but there are so many different QSP uh, penguins out there. You can you can have brass. You can have um, all sorts of different colored G10s and micartas and different blade steels. This is their winner. I mean, QSP, that's their that's their bug out or or what have you. So these are the knives I was carrying in my pocket today. Uh, the off grid knives came in XL. Such an outstanding, nice, big smooth flipper the um jack wolf knives midnight jack a beautiful classy incredible that i i forgot to mention how well that blade cuts and how precisely uh you can get in there with that tip 
awesome knife. Great walk and talk again. And the QSP Penguin. Also in my carta this time, denim. All right, please leave below in a comment uh, what you were carrying. And uh, um, be honest, tell me everything you were carrying. It's okay. We have some uh, people like... Uh, well, I won't name names here, but uh, like Blade Ogre, who carries eight knives a day, and uh, it works for him. He, it's, you know, he, that's his system, and he uses those knives. I appreciate that, and I appreciate that he admits he carries all those knives. I, I take a stash with me just in case. Uh, so let me know what you were carrying. Also, um, if you're interested in supporting the show, you can go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon and check out the different tiers of support and the different things you get, like interview extras kind of a, a off the record interview stuff uh, uh, that you can get which is cool and a knife giveaway you can be entered into and other exclusive content and i think we're going to be doing a martial blade thing coming up here soon um but i i still have to uh i still have to examine that idea um but Go to Patreon, check it out. You get a lot of good stuff, and it helps this show keep going. Quickest way to do, do that is to hit the Q, uh, QR code there or go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. I will repeat that complex URL. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. If you're a knife junkie, you're always in the market for a new knife, and we've got you covered. For the latest weekly knife deals, be sure to visit thenifejunkie.com slash knives. Through our special affiliate relationships, we bring you weekly knife specials on your favorite knives. Help support the show and save money on a new knife. Shop at thenifejunkie.com slash knives. That's thenifejunkie.com slash knives. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. I saw a the cool knives in that really cool new liner uh tour knives anyone tour knives uh let me know what you think of tour knives i don't have any yet and and and, and i've been flirting with getting them uh but just let me know i like i like the story I like the backstory speaking of backstory zero tolerance is reaching back into the archive for a new release uh they're going to the zero four seven zero that's uh sinkovich design uh it's a 2018 release man very beautiful knife it, it came in marbled carbon fiber inlay and i think 20 cv steel and uh it had a titanium frame you know this the titanium color titanium frame well now uh for a uh, factory special series they are releasing this beautiful version of this i do love this knife i've never owned it but i've owned its little brother um from the my wife, I gave my wife its little brother from the Kershaw lineup. Can't remember what that one's called, but it looks the same. Sinkovich, one of my favorite, uh, Dmitry Sinkovich, one of my favorite designers. I just love his work. So this is a beautiful thing, and it's nice to see it come back out. Too bad it's the only thing that I'm seeing ZT uh, come out with because they're so they've made such great knives in the past. This is actually you know evidence of that. Uh, but I'd love to see some great new knives coming from them. Any case, that's uh, beating a dead horse. What they're doing here is uh, coating, black coating the um, titanium handles, giving you a copper inlay and giving you S110V on that blade. How cool is that? You get DLC coated blade of S110V in that in that beautiful um, format. That that knife. I mean, just look at this. And actually, this is cool having the black all black knife on that all white background because that's what I'm talking about. That beautiful silhouette that beautiful profile i mean it looks angular in a way but man it is so comfortable in hand and that blade that slightly clip point blade is ah it's gorgeous i might have to i'm, I'm talking myself into finding this though i'm sure the price will send me in the other direction uh oh and and the only reason i say that is because uh right now i'm i'm i'm, I'm being careful with with my shekels and uh though i would love to have this thing um I know that their factory special series are, you know, they're for the dedicated collector. And I am not a ded dedicated collector to ZT anymore. I have my five ZTs, and that's pretty much how it's going to stay, probably. Uh, unless they do the right thing and next year come out with a, a line of, like, American-made frame locks that are just awesome. We'll see. 
All right, next up, Laconico Designs. Love Ray Laconico's stuff. Simple, beautiful, clean designs. We we all know and love Ray Laconico. Well, he's got the Andromeda coming out with Artisan, and we talked about the Andromeda a little while ago on the show, but it's taken a while to come to market. Uh, the Andromeda, beautiful uh, 3.4-inch drop point blade, long and slender. I love the, again, this is another beautiful profile. Look at that. That handle is long and slender, and it has it's it's very non-committed or non-committal except at the pommel. You got that bird's beak, that beautiful. I mean, this almost looks like it's more set up for reverse grip uh, with that really nicely done pommel with that facet at the end. Um, again, like I was saying, really nicely swedged drop point blade. It's got a center line point. If you look at where the point is, it lines up with the uh, pivot and the um, opening hole. And as is apropos for the day, you got a button lock. So, man, I, I, I'm in. I, I'm all in on this. I would like to get it. I would like to get more artisan cutlery knives. I noticed recently that um, one artisan, also designed by Ray Laconico, that I just loved when I had it on loan here is the... Um, oh, what's that one? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a front flipper. <laughs> Help me through my senior moment. Anyway, they've they've just come out. It's the, I know you're all yelling at your speakers. I will remember it and I will come back out with it. But, but oh, the Centauri, the Centauri. Thank you. Thank you, God. Uh, the Centauri has come back out and it's in all these different iterations, both in a mini and a, and a full-size 3.4-inch version. Um, and it's got a lot of different handle materials and is a beautiful knife. So I want to get back behind the wheel of some artisans. I don't have too many in my collection. I have a CJRB and I have that artisan, uh, sort of Bally song multi-tool thing, which is very cool. Bally song switchblade multi-tool. My brother-in-law got me, uh, for my birthday a few years ago. Very cool thing. Artisan does impressive work and, uh, well, I need more, I guess. All right. So. Still to come on the Knife Junkie podcast, we're going to take a look at a couple of knives coming through my, uh, coming across my desk and uh, one that is all mine. And then we take a look at 10 of the absolute meanest fixed blade knives. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. The Cold Steel Kudu. I bought one on a Lark uh, about a year ago. Pulled it out of its box and it broke immediately. <laughs> I opened it up. And this was the kind that had the ratcheted ring lock. So it had a little tab uh, on the end of the tang of the blade that protruded through a hole on this back spring. And it had a, a, a split ring tab on it and you lifted it up to unlock the knife. Um, I pulled up, I bought the thing, I, I opened it once and I pulled it up to undo it. And it just the the cheap steel on the back of the of the spring just broke like immediately. And it was a sealed box. It was not like someone had it for a, a year and a half and then returned it to Amazon. It was in a sealed box. So I was like, I made a review or not a review, but a video and talked about what a piece of junk it was. And I n almost never do that. You know, like I have a. Uh, I have beef with uh, with a person in the knife world. I don't talk about it publicly. Um, I got, uh, you know, I don't like a knife. I'm not going to go out of my way to make a video about why I don't like it. But when if when it's a, you know, when it's an absolute waste of money, I I, I feel like I'm obligated. Well, they came out, uh, they being Cold Steel, came out with a version of the Kudu uh, that does not have that lock situation. It's more of a very stout slip joint. I got it for free when I uh, got my Manticore XL from um, or my Manticore X from Smoky Mountain Knife Works. This was a freebie that came because I spent a certain amount of money. And I got to say, they totally redeemed themselves in this knife. Uh, I think this is about a $12 knife. So take that into account after you hear everything I say. But it's it's got if let's look at the handle here. It's grivery. But it's integral grivery. You can't see a seam, which is kind of nice. Oh, wait. Actually, I can see it now that it's under under the camera. But integral or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's melted together plastic, two uh, slabs pinned together. You have an adjustable uh, pivot there, but it's pinned together with the lock. So you're not taking this thing apart. 
I guess you can remove the blade though. Uh, this piece on the back is not only comfortable and not only reinforceable with the thumb. I mean, that is the lock right there. So it's nice to know that you have, you're putting pressure like on a slip joint on that, uh, on that part there. Uh, and you're exerting force upward on the edge. So it's pretty stout. It's got great uh, stiffness. It's got a half stop there, and it's got great walk and talk. And it really snaps open, and it doesn't lock, but it it uh, that lot this um, spring really keeps it in place very, very nicely. That polished blade is glorious 5CR15 MOV. And, um, you know, for a $12 knife that you that you buy and throw in your car, this would make an ideal muffin knife back in the days when I was driving my girls to uh, daycare. You know, I'd get a muffin at the grocery store. I'd cut it in half. I always had a little slip joint, right? A rather large slip joint in there. The uh, the uh, sod buster from Case. It was like this knife. This would have done great. You know, this is one of those knives. It, it can do a lot more than cut muffins, uh, incidentally. But I mean, this is a great cheap work knife you can use this thing it's sharp as hell it's going to dull quickly but you can strop it back up quickly uh it's just a great little piece of kit you know and throw it throw it in your backpack throw it in your car you know or carry it i mean it's light as hell and it's a substantially sized knife at one three four and a half inches of glorious five cr15 i mean it care like i said it carries light you forget it's in your pocket I have been carrying it recently because I just got it. And I really, I do like it. This would be cool in a lockback uh, in this profile, i got to say, with nicer materials. So that's it. The Cold Steel Kudu. You have redeemed yourself. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to have this uh, because I was bummed about the last, uh, that last thing, that last uh, situation. All right, next up, <clears throat> um, I got this from Mike Emler via... Jared Neve via the maker. Uh, this is the river. I keep saying river city. Like, I don't know why this is the steel city fang. And I've been looking at this knife quite a bit on Instagram. And you can probably tell from the package. It's a, it's a small knife, but you can probably tell here it is with the QSP penguin that it's a P call style fixed blade self-defense knife. Coming from a person who has uh, studied martial arts their whole life, or at least I think they said martial blade craft, so different forms of uh, of martial arts with knives, and um, he says he's had a few scrapes with a knife and has gleaned from years of training and experience uh, this design <clears throat> for everyday carry and self-defense for everyday carry self-defense is what I mean. But I mean, no doubt you could open a box with it here. My left hand is so ridiculous sometimes. Okay. So uh, in the waistband or in the pocket, we got the ulti clip here and uh, I would wear this. I would carry this uh, in at the three o'clock position in the waistband. That's where I keep most. Actually, this is small enough that I might put this, uh, do this appendix carry. Uh, appendix carry is very handy, and I would carry all my knives that way, all my uh, fixed blade knives that way, if I could. But they, it's usually uncomfortable to me. This is small enough that I believe, especially if I put a, um, I would probably put a uh, a discrete carry clip, and if you angle it, you know this might sit right in that fold, very nicely. Any anyway, let's look at the knife. Very good sheath, by the way, too, and that is such a big factor when we're talking about not only just fixed blade knives but everyday carry fixed blade knives uh, the sheath has to be good uh, this is aebl it's uh double quenched and and double tempered i believe he said i have to i have to um i'm gonna do a full video on this and i will talk about everything he he sent in his uh text in his dm to me but uh the steel is nice aebl i love that steel i have it on i've used it on a couple of knives i've made and uh i've had it on other knives on loan um nice steel you can use this knife in a lot of different ways you can use it like a clinch pick where you can mount it you're gonna mount it like this uh you're gonna use it like this and that is to draw it this way 
and uh, do back cuts on someone, say uh, that whole clinch pick thing uh, where you use a Pakal style blade, except you use it like this forward grip has to do with being in a car because it was developed by a, a former undercover guy being in a car and having someone reach across and try and grab your gun. So you pull this out of your belt and you can just, you can just pull back up and you're cutting him. So um, you can use that knife this way, but of course this is optimized for that uh, gross motor motion um, from that you would be likely to exhibit if you were under stress and using a knife, unless you're the coolest and most experienced of characters, you are probably going to be really, really amped up. And uh, so all of the, um, all of the little intricate, uh, Kali moves that you know uh, might go out the window and you might be going into caveman mode. Well, this really truly is like a cat's claw or a, a, a talon. Uh, unlike a karambit, which is facing this way, no animal attacks that way. This is how animals attack. This is how my cat gets me with regularity. And so that's what that takes advantage of. The arcing motion of your elbow and your shoulder and... Um, it's 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 really beautiful. I love the angle off of my knuckles uh, that that curve comes because uh, it takes advantage of here. Let's go to the main camera for a second, Jim. Oh, and there I go banging stuff. It takes advantage of this. You can back fist with this uh, like you would if you were just back fisting. Um, but but you can do it forward. And the way that angle uh, of the blade, the way the blade reaches out at that angle, you don't have to cant your wrist. You can kind of just back fist and get that tip right on point it's it's really a nice uh I, I i like this knife a lot and i gotta say the handle uh is small tear dropped and nestles tightly into your hand into your hand it's there's no uh puño or pommel there that could possibly uh, be used to lever the knife out of your hand in a disarm it's really in there it reminds me of the old cold steel desperado a knife i desperately wanted for so long and now it's you know, it's it's an eBay find if it is, but it had a handle shape like this, and then it had a five and a half inch or a five inch vaquero blade coming out this way. But it was doing the same thing, taking advantage of that shape uh, that you can really lock in your palm, and then you use the flat of the blade and the flat nature of the handle to stabilize it from turning in your hand. So, I mean, it's a really great little handle. Um, I could see just gripping onto this thing for dear life and and having no concern. It's a fist. It's a totally closed fist that I can make there. I could. Uh, I, I haven't tried this, but I could. I could probably punch somewhat full force with my knuckles closed around that. Uh, and I'm not gonna try that. <laughs> but well, maybe I will. Um, go out and hit the punching bag because, like, I don't have to worry about the uh, the the tip or the edge cutting the bag. So maybe I will give that a try. In any case, this is a really uh, nice self-defense knife and it is all that you need i mean I'm, we're going to be talking here in a minute about the 10 meanest fixed blades in my collection and they are all like i've been called to a pit fight and i have to knife fight for my life what knife am i going to bring kind of thing uh not a walking around town self-defense knife and, and that is the real sort of um, mode you would need a you know you're walking around town and you need a knife and you need it for self-defense, this is just the kind of thing because it is small, discreet, easy to carry, uh, useful in other ways, um, but extremely useful if you if you needed a self-defense knife. But look at this. You work in a warehouse, too, or you just open boxes. This is actually a very comfortable position uh, for that utility cut. Here's your box. You don't have to do you don't have to do anything. The, the blade is doing it for you, and it fits really nicely in hand like this. So it's not just a weapon. This thing is a very useful uh, all-around tool. So very interested in this knife. This is the Fang from uh, Steel City Cutlery, and uh, very interesting. I look. I want to talk to this guy about this knife and his other creations. All right. Thank you guys for sending this along to me, and thank you. Uh, steel city for loaning that to me uh lastly um knives from a gentleman who's going to be on the show dan eastland of dogwood custom knives um dan eastland of dogwood custom knives makes uh, he's he's also co-host of the knife perspective podcast he makes amazing kitchen knives 
he, he makes outdoor knives. I have not experienced them. I like the way they look. Uh, but he has sent me, he sent me three of his custom kitchen knives to check out. And they are so cool. Uh, and not just cool. They are very, very, they're amazing. And they really um, point out the difference between a nice expensive production knife, like the Henkels we ha or the um, Vustoffs and the Shuns that we have. Um, and custom kitchen knives these are so thin they're they're a 16th of an inch thin and then just uh you know really really thinly ground and then you have these beautiful handles some of the grinds he does he makes these the blade stock so thin that he only to get the um i can't remember what he said the angle was behind the edge but to get the appropriate angle behind the edge he doesn't have to grind all the way up full flat Whereas when he goes up, these two are 16th of an inch, very, very thin. And then when he goes up in size, is this 330 seconds, I think. Oh, by the way, that's a nice crown spine. But then he goes full flat ground to get that same um, behind the edge uh, geometry as he does on the thinner blades. So really, really nice. He has an interesting, I really like his... Uh, idea about his kitchen knives. I mean, he he has found found a niche uh, uh, in the industry of kitchen knives. Okay, let me tell you what it is. He's got uh, custom knives that you, you you pay a lot of money for, but you say you're a chef. This is your living, and you want a really sweet knife, and you're going to use it for years, and you spend you know a thousand bucks on a great custom knife from him. Or he's got a line of mid tech knives. Uh, which you're spending about 400 bucks where some of the parts are manufactured out of house. He does the handle, he does the sharpening and all that stuff. And, uh, or he's working on starting a um, more production line. But instead of them being like, you go to Macy's or you go to the kitchen uh, aisle at, at any department store and you see the kitchen knives there, they're all black handled or sometimes white. If you, if you, <laughs> you know, if you're in for an exciting treat, his idea is, look, we got, we got this uh, spectrum of knives in the pocket knife world, you know, where you can get for inexpensive, you can get great handles and different steels and this and that. Well, he wants to bring that to the kitchen knife scene and for less money allow people who are who either want to class up the game in their own kitchen or they're professionals but they don't have the cash to lay down for a custom you can buy something like this with an interesting knife handle and s35 vn that's the blade steel he likes for kitchen knives and uh and you can get it for a a low cost so or a low relatively low cost so he's another one of these knife makers who has the the three tier like beyond edc or um uh well there are a number of them but they have the three tier system where they have the very high custom the the mid-range mid-tech and then the inexpensive but the whole idea of dogwood is they are all on all levels will all look unique so you you even if you buy one of the inexpensive production knives you'll have a cool handle why settle for white or black handles when you can have something cool like this contoured um, G10. Uh, he, uh, Dan Eastland, worked with a company that is no longer extant, but he has all of the material that they had left over once they left. And uh, I don't want to give too much away, so you can you can watch the, the podcast, but um, they were making scales for chef's knives that were uniquely chef-like. And this handle is made of wild rice so that's wild rice compressed in you know with heat and um epoxy to make this so that that is wild rice which i think is really cool and he he detailed the the issues with using rice that was an experimental thing and these are his personal blades uh but very very interesting show you got to check that one out and he's just a great guy and man uh, this has sort of opened my eyes to chef's knives um, in terms of, you know, I don't have to re-outfit the entire kitchen, but it would be nice to get something like this. As a matter of fact, I love this one. I think this is called El Jefe. Uh, it was designed for, or maybe it's not. It's some. It was designed for a chef, and he wanted um, he wanted the traditional French contours, uh, but with some additions. So. He made it. 
he got to check it out in the kitchen for a month and then he gave feedback and they tweaked it and there you have that model so very interesting stuff it's uh, kitchen knives uh, but to me the approach sounds a lot like the kind of knives i'm into on a regular basis so dogwood custom knives dan eastland cool stuff also uh i am going on i'm going to be a guest on the knife perspective podcast and we're doing going on this week or next week and i'm not sure when they're going to release it but i look forward to it all right so those are the kind of fixed blades we usually use right the kitchen knives those are the knives i use the most in my life probably you do too but in surveying my collection i I did notice that I have a, a preponderance of more martial style blades uh, like the ones behind me. And uh, that's kind of my instinct for collecting. Uh, even when it comes to something like a QSP penguin, I, I always think of its martial application too, just for fun or whatever hobby, you know, I've been doing martial arts a long time. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's just my fascination with weaponry and that kind of thing, but I'm always considering, but there are some knives that you don't have to, uh, you don't have to push your imagination to figure out how you would use it as a weapon. And these 10 are just the meanest, nastiest, I think. I don't know. I, I have a lot. And, and the list could be larger, but I wanted to keep it to 10. And I wanted each one to represent something unique, uniquely nasty. Okay, first one up is we're going back in time here. This is a Filipino garab. And uh, I picked this one. This is the first one that came to mind because... This was a field implement, but also a weapon. And uh, the thing about this weapon and about a lot of Filipino uh, weapons is that they present that cutting angle, that cutting edge at an angle to the blade that is sort of kukri-like, uh, even though it's not shaped like a kukri. I mean, I guess one could argue it's sort of like a slender kukri, but what I'm getting at is the angle is always kind of downward on the blade downward to the handle, which accelerates uh, the efficiency of a chop and of a cut and of a slash. I mean, it makes a slash into a chop, basically. Um, and so this knife is is sharp. It's chisel ground flat on this side, probably from a truck spring or something. Um, and it's old. Now, this is not the original blade handle or knife handle. This looks like it was a piece of furniture that was repurposed uh, once the handle on this uh, came off, it's it's difficult to control because it's circular. Um, it's it's kind of hard you, hard to stop it from turning in the hand. Uh, though this portion up here is unsharpened, so you can reach up like that. Uh, Nat, I don't really use this, but I have tested it. I don't use it at all, but I have tested it out as I have all of my swords behind me. Very very sharp. Uh, the reason this is number one. Uh, it's not number. This, these are not rank ordered. But the reason I this one out of all of my other Filipino things, which I know have seen action because they are old and they are real. Um, but this one right here, uh, I had a friend who was a little woo woo. You know, she was a little bit on the on the um, spiritual side or whatever, and she was looking at my knives and checking them out. And oh, that's cool. Oh, that's nice, including some of the historical things. But when she got to this, she it freaked her out. She's like, oh, this one. Oh, I don't know about this one. This one's, mm, I don't know. This this one's really nasty. It's not about this one. So I don't know. I, who knows what, what the history of this thing is. Um, but I do know from the design of it, I'm looking at it right now from an angle uh, where it's presented like this. And you can just see how, how, well, it's hard to see. Let's go to this camera here. You can see how that how that angle here the handle is coming straight at you, but that that blade is is, is so canted off uh, to maximize damage, and it's just a dirty thing. I don't know. I don't know something about this knife. So I'm putting that on there. This this has the woo factor. This has the uh, je ne sais quoi. It is just so bad. And I'm not going to line them up today because these knives are all kind of big. Okay, next up we go from from very old and um, somewhat primitive to very new and just amazing pedigree on this knife. This is the uh, Spartan Harzi dagger. Um, Spartan Spartan blades uh, is the maker of it, Curtis Iovito um, and and company uh, made this and 
I'm showing it in the sheath because this is a Chattanooga Leatherworks sheath, and uh, that's an RMJ company. RMJ, the the tomahawk company, own that in American Tomahawk and Chattanooga Leatherworks. And man, they are my favorite. I've had a few of them. They're just the greatest leather sheaths. So I had to show it off. Uh, you got the Spartan logo, Spartan Blades logo embossed in there with the arrows, the hoplite helmet, and the dagger. But let's look at the dagger. Designed by the great and powerful Bill Harzi. Oh, this thing is just beautiful. And if you're not looking, I mean, if you're not watching, if you're driving or something like that, just imagine a perfectly symmetrical dagger with a with a dramatically coke-bellied handle in all aspects. Um, whether it, you're looking down from the dorsal side with the jimping up towards the thumb and the forefinger or whether you're looking at it in profile and and uh, seeing those two deep grooves where your finger where your finger and thumb dig in and then the big bulbous swell behind it and the pommel which allows you to not only bust noggins but cap with the thumb so that's something i really like that the tang protrudes through the sandwiched G10. You can see this contour G10 is fully sandwiched and fully jackets the tang of this blade. And uh, so the blade comes up through here and then presents itself at the very tip in that triangle. You can break glass with that. You can also, uh, you know, uh, use that for pain compliance or strike the back of someone's hand with that. Oh, that would be incredibly painful. Um, yeah, this right here, this jimping here where you where you grip just feels perfect in this uh, saber grip like this. Just feels absolutely perfect. Like it was made for my hand. That blade is six inches, double-edged, hollow ground, S35VN, PVD coated, um, just wicked. And you've got the beautiful steel cross guard with the quillions flaring forward which i love uh, it just kind of gives you a little room uh for your hand there and uh something to push off of if you're if you're pushing this in this is just a very purpose-driven uh weapon tool thing and i i show you this as probably my favorite version like period i love bill harsey's designs i love the historical things like the like the uh, one right over my shoulder here, the um, Fairbairn Sykes, love that. I, I love the uh, Combat Stiletto number two from, from Randall Made Knives, but this one takes the cake. It is just a thing of beauty. It is the quintessential dagger, and um, but made by a company who does incredible work. I'm glad I, <laughs> I'm glad I was irresponsible that late night that I bought this um, because... You know, it's one of those purchases that I'm really glad I have it. But these are expensive knives. And uh, uh, I do know I got this one secondhand. So whoever had this before me took beautiful care of it. All right. Spartan Harzi Dagger. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, next up is a custom. And uh, one, of, one that I had uh, produced a few years ago and uh, carried for a while. And I haven't carried this one in a while. It it it's for a while I thought it was pretty easy to 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 EDC, and then I got knives that are much easier to EDC. So I don't carry this that much. Plus, it's pretty damn menacing, and it would be a hard one to say. Oh, well, well, officer, I use it for work. Uh, this is the Monkey Thumper by Black Rock Knives. This is a custom one. You can get if you like this design. You can get a monkey thumper now made by Fox Knives. It's awesome. It won uh, knife of the one of the knife of the year awards at Blade 2021, and uh, they do such a beautiful job. I'm holding it in the sheath again to show you one of the best sheaths in the industry. I know I'll, I'll keep saying that because people have really gotten great at making sheaths. Ken Vihikite of Black Rock Knives is not an exception. He did a great job of sheathing this rather maybe possibly difficult to sheath knife uh knife oh i was following ken for a long time black rock knives for a long time and always kind of just mm, always stopped on this knife and and widened the picture and examined and i always just dug this and then one day a couple of years back he showed a shot of his workbench with a bunch of these blanks and he said who wants in and i said i want in 
and um, told him I wanted the the tan G10 and uh, and asked him to double edge it. He said no problem, and he double edged it. And this is a really for the size that blade is. Let's see, one, two, three and a half inches. It is a pretty pretty powerful tool here. Uh, okay, again, uh, this is how I would use this. It's it's set up as a karambit. You could definitely use it as such. It's a little big for my hand as a karambit, and I'm not so dedicated to the methods of karambitism. <laughs> I might actually, if I had it in reverse, I would, I would hold it like this. Uh, that ring and the shape around it is great for holding it just like this, for not using the ring. He sets it up perfectly to use the ring or not basically is what I'm getting at. Uh, I mostly do not use it. So in this forward grip, it gives you that, again, that angle downward from the knuckles. And that really, really accelerates the cut. Look at the straight lines uh, that my knuckles are parallel to. And then look at how the blade interrupts that so deeply uh, by, I mean, you know, here you can see it's like by an inch. That's not, okay, so let's go like this. Yeah, it just it it cuts in deeply because it has that recurve uh, effect in the downward angle. And then on the back, naturally, because it is not as thin behind the edge here, this edge is very sharp, but it's more of a a um, splitting edge. If you were to use this in a back cut like this or somehow use this, if you were going to caramb it, use it and flip it and then and then stop it here and use it to hit, you would split what you were hitting more than cut it. It's more like an ax edge there. Ooh, that's sharp. I just touched the tip. Uh, so just an awesome, awesome knife. Pretty versatile. Uh, you can, you can, you know, like with the hand holds and the different ways you could, you could use this in reverse grip. It would be a nasty, nasty thing. Um, yeah, gr great knife, this monkey thumper. Check out the Fox version. And uh, it might it might be of interest to you. They do not do all the cool texturing on the blades. I, I do like that rock texture. Um, it's cool to see he'll show his blades before he puts that texture on. To I don't know if this is why, but it's sort of, sort of proving that his grinds are on point and that he's not using those to hide a bad grind. I think some people sometimes might texture the blade to sort of hide the fact that their grinds are uneven, which that's fine too. All right, that's the Black Rock Knives Monkey Thumper, a nasty uh, combination of different features uh, to make this little fixed blade knife uh, pretty pretty mean. Next up, I, I couldn't do this without a representative of from the Pical <laughs> world. And uh, this one, the Pinkerton Cave Bear, is just... Whew, this is a this is a pretty devastating one. This is a, a purchase from Blade Show 2021. I talked about this a lot ad nauseum. You know the story, but great sheath. Uh, and I like the way he brings the kydex up unnecessarily high because if you're wearing this in the waistband, which is what I do, uh, it's nice to have that little bit of extra uh, kydex against your flesh, against your love handles as you're pulling this blade out. You know, look at this. This is Nitro V double edged hand ground. He is an incredible. He's uh, Dirk Pinkerton is very well respected in the uh, knife making world for his grinds. And this is a perfect example of beautiful, perfect, even grinds. And that's four of them on a curve that he need, needed to make. I, I would imagine that's not easy. I'm no Dirk Pinkerton, but I imagine that is not easy. It is sharp, wickedly razor sharp on both edges. And then, of course, comes to a tremendous point. Uh, that is one, three, uh, three, almost four inches, like 3.8 inches on that blade length. And I was talking before when I was looking at the Steel City, this kind of motion. Imagine that with a knife this big and this sharp and this pointy. But it has that nice Ronald McDonald sort of colorful cheerful handle in micarta that i love i love that i love that color combination of the black on that just terrifying uh blade and then that sort of happy color combination on the micarta cognitive dissonance people you know psychological warfare in the fight 
Oh, it can't hurt you. Look at how pleasant the. All right. So that is the Pinkerton Cave Bear, one of his many really, really, really cool customs. I mean, he just makes. He does a lot of really cool modern interpretations of ethnographic weapons. He does a jambaya. He he does a navaja. Just he's a cool dude making cool stuff. All right. Speaking of cool dudes making cool stuff. Douglas Esposito's Attention to Detail Mercantile, or A2D. Uh, this is the first knife I got from him, wearing a sheath that my brother made uh, to my design. An ill-fated Ill design. I thought I would wear this in the, in the belt and have this kind of stop it from slipping out like you would on a big Bowie. And then I realized that relies on a really big blade to make that work. So anyway, a beautiful sheath made, my, made by my brother. This came in Kydex, though, which I don't use. <clears throat> But the blade, oh my God, this knife is so awesome. The medium fighter in a bayonet grind, and I had him double-edge it. I picked this up from him when he uh, had his workshop in Manassas, Virginia, out here. He's moved since to Mississippi. And uh, yeah, Mississippi. And still just making incredible knives, though he is now focused on these outstanding frame locks. They're just so beautiful and come in so many different variations. Um, but he, uh, started with fixed blades and had a number of them. And this, uh, fighter came in three different sizes. And I thought this one was perfect. Uh, one, two, three, four. It's about, wait, did I lose count counting up to five? Yeah. It's about five inches, uh, in length. Wait a second. Yeah. Five, five, Bob. Oh my God. All right. <clears throat> Sorry. I don't know what it is when I look at this grid. Maybe I just need a different grid. It confounds the eyes. S35VN, hollow ground, very thinly hollow ground on this primary edge. Here, he doesn't have enough room to get very thin, but it's nice and thin and hollow ground. So, I mean, this back edge is not a splitting edge. This is a slicing edge. This is definitely a slicing edge. Um, I love... Uh, tortoiseshell and i saw he had made a knife with tortoiseshell just prior so had to get that tortoiseshell on there classy assassin's knife you've got a crowned spine all the way around and the spine sits proud of the um of the tortoiseshell handle you've got a copper or no i'm, I'm sorry a brass liner in there and pins awesome jimping this thing is just incredible i'm glad i got this when I could, I'm not sure if he's doing this stuff anymore um, because I, I, all I ever see, I think his bread and butter are the folders, but man, his fixed blades are awesome. I came very close to buying a Tonto of his and I just, you know, it was a blade show and I was just moseying around and came back and it was gone. That's the kind of thing that happens when you don't strike when the iron's hot. All right. That is the A2D medium fighter. All right, switching gears to something uh, menacing from history. Uh, this is a modern reproduction thanks to Cold Steel, but this is the Rondell Dagger. This a gift from my brother. He gives me such cool stuff. Um, I got two gifts from my brother in this lineup, actually. Three! I have three. <laughs> thanks, Vic. All right, so this Rondell Dagger is a... Um, here, first of all, it's in a really cool sheath. It's almost like a chisel ground sheath because <laughs> on the back you have the seam. It's triangular, but it but it favors this one side. Very nice shape and throat of metal, uh, steel. But what this thing is, it's a triple-edged dagger that comes to a very sharp point. But that point is stout and steady because it's backed up by a pyramid of sharpened steel. Now, these edges are polished. And again, if you hit someone on the forearm with this really hard and hit them with the edge, it would split. It wouldn't cut, slice, slash. Uh, it would split, which would just be horrible. But what this is really for is for thrusting between... Oh, my gosh. It's for thrusting between plate mail, or between chain mail and plate armor. So you're close in fighting. You're a knight. And uh, you've been disarmed. Your sword, maybe it broke because it's a... It's brittle and you're working with medieval technology and, um, you know, you're up, you're in a clinch, you're up close. The guy's trying to hit you with his mace, but you're up close. You pull your rondelle dagger, you, you, you 
find a little spot in the armor and you push it in. That's what this is for dispatching knights. And, uh, <laughs> but it, it makes for a great, you know, it's, it's a timeless weapon. Uh, I have thought of this thing often as a small, um, like a collie stick, but just like a small percussive instrument, uh, with menacing edges that you could, you could use in a thrust. You look at the hand, it's this dark wood. I'm not sure what the wood is. We'll call it lignum vitae. I'm sure it isn't. <laughs> I'm positive it isn't, but for argument's sake. Uh, and it has a steel round pommel that really keeps you in. And then a steel round um, guard up here. And then these little brass pins and, the, and all the carving in the wood. It has an incredible grip. And since it's triple edged and those edges are all symmetrical and you, you're not cutting with it, the rounded, perfectly rounded handle makes absolutely no difference because you're using this sucker to thrust. So a rounded handle on the rondel dagger is not an annoyance. It's 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 in it maybe even a benefit because you don't have to worry about orientation. You don't have to use that, lose that millisecond of thought in the battle to worry about orientation. You just pull it out and jam it in. So great sheath, cool knife. Uh, this is a one that I keep stashed in a strategic location in the house in case I ever have to thwart a knight. <clears throat> Next up, another gift from my brother. This one he gave me in 1993. I believe this was a graduation from college gift. Yes, that's how old I am. <laughs> oh, I'm not shy about it. Uh, but this was a, a knife that K-Bar... Um, reintroduced in the late it's a reissue not reintroduced it's a, a reissue of the original world war ii usmc k-bar beautiful leather sheath very nice and stout leather sheath with the with the um eagle globe and anchor embossed in there and then you've got the beautiful uh what you expect from a k-bar the beautiful stacked leather handle that pommel with the interesting pin through the tang construction uh, you've got the quillions that I always thought faced the wrong direction. Personally, I always thought they should be bent towards the tip, uh, like you saw on the Spartan Harzy. But, hey, I didn't design the damn K-Bar. Uh, beautiful blade. This this one is 1095, and I think it's the Crovan. And in keeping with the design of the day, it, it comes to a very sharp uh, swedge. So that swedge from here to here, sharp enough to well sharp enough to cut and i know in world war ii uh they taught a fighting method where you would slash with the um with the with the swedge a lot i think they called it the randall fighting method because randall knives the swedge is always sharp and with this that this would if i had to fight someone with this knife heaven forbid i might do it just like that because that hawk bill tip that you get from that sharpened swedge would be just nastier in a in a slash than that beautiful bellied blade. This is also a great utility knife. Uh, maybe not in this particular um, setup, but um, would make a great utility knife. But why this makes the meanest fixed blades list, uh, though I have other knives that might look more overtly mean, this one is history tested as being a knife that has gone to hell and back. And... Uh, has sent a lot of people to hell. Uh, oh, that was so dramatic. That was like the back of a pulp novel. I, I should start doing that. Uh, but uh, so just an outstanding knife. And uh, I keep meaning to get a modern one just to have. But then I'm like, really? You have so many knives just to have. Do you do you need another K-Bar? You already got a K-Bar, Bob. Uh, but this one with the double-edged uh, tip and that sharpened swedge, I'm so grateful for my brother for getting for me for getting me this at that time, because I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find one like that. Next up, this list would not be complete without a really big, bad Bowie. And this is the biggest bat. Uh, this is in the running for the biggest, baddest Bowie I have. Uh, I have a sword that might be technically bigger, but I don't know if it's badder. This is the Bark River Knives Shining Mountain Bowie. Just an incredible knife. Uh, I have the, uh, the frog off of it right now frog off the sheath but as per usual beautiful leather sheath here's the blade that big quarter inch 
sweeping, beautiful Bowie shaped blade. Oh my gosh. I love this knife. Um, and I talk about it all the time. Whenever I draw this out and show it, I say, this is the knife with the blade shape, uh, that Brad Pitt had in Inglorious Bastards, same blade shape. Uh, he had a, 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 a crowned stag piece of stag on there. That was beautiful. Uh, very, very movie-ish knife. Um, of course, the one thing that always kind of sticks in my craw about Bark River um, is that uh, on their swedges, they never they never even come close to having it something that could be sharp. And how cool would it be? You know, Bark River Knives does all of their edges appleseed or convexed, um, very very sharp. And but also, you know, you can be slicey with these kind of edges, but also stout and sturdy for chopping and toughness. Uh, but imagine if you had that same kind of apple seed edge here, even if it were more oblique and more for splitting than for cutting, it would make this, it would take this to the next, next level, the next level of Bowie as weapon. But I love that big sweeping um, blade and that asymmetrical guard and the giant area where you can choil area where you can put your finger there. Um, this one, you know, comes uh, as Bark Rivers do in a many different handles. Uh, I got the antiqued stacked wood or stacked um, leather. And then you get that really nice aluminum butt cap. So <sighs> devastating, large here. I'm going to go over here just so you get an idea. Devastating, large Bowie knife um, for utility. But of course, this is more about being mean so this is one big mean bowie all right two more this next one is an iconic piece of history uh a knife i have always wanted an ultimate grail for me and also for my brother and this is what a great man he is he found one in the perfect configuration and he gave it to me uh that's the kind of man my brother is he's awesome okay so this is the 1918 us 1918 trench knife in with the sharp with the pointy knuckles it comes in a couple of different configurations with the pointy knuckles and the double-edged blade uh the sheath is slightly damaged there there was once a little bridge of metal here that you could slip your belt in but this thing is incredible the handle solid cast bronze actually fits my hand perfectly um which leads me to believe this was designed and made at a time uh, before bovine growth hormone, I think we've all gotten bigger because I have medium sized hands and you would imagine they would make the handle bigger if average hands were bigger. If the average hand were, I feel like today the average hand is bigger. I feel like people are just larger, but that's a different, uh, that's a different topic of conversation. If you look at this thing, you can tell what it's for. Um, it's not for butter and it's not for, um, EDC, that's not for cardboard. <laughs> You've got a double-edged blade here. This is pretty dulled down at this point, this back edge especially. Um, and then you have this heavy, heavy handle. It feels so good and it feels so secure. You really feel like you could go take on the world with this gripped in your hand like this. Uh, nice weight. You've got this uh, pointed nut here on the end of the tang. Uh, they echo this in the Chaos series by Cold Steel, which has a, a knuckle duster and then a, a pointy nut like that. So any way you, you push this thing, it, it, it causes pain and destruction. Here, let's come to the main camera here because uh, it's kind of awkward to hold. But in, in, in any orientation, I mean, you can get punched with it. You can get uh, hammer fisted with it. Of course, you can get stabbed from the front or the back with it. You can get slashed. It's a just a purpose-driven trench weapon, and uh, it didn't last for too long. It, its utility um, applications were uh, greatly limited, and casting that handle was a lot of metal, and they had to um, maintain their strategic metal reserves and such. So they, they, they didn't make this one for too long, and they replaced it with the leather-stacked handled M3 trench knife, which has a a semi double edged it's a bayoneted double edge and uh a, a, a much lower profile and much uh, lighter and easier to carry this of course is very handle heavy um might be a weird thing to carry might feel weird uh because well because it's so handle heavy i don't know i haven't carried it, it it's usually on the wall 
on occasion, I'll bring it down if I hear something go bump in the night. But that is my U.S. 1918 trench knife. Uh, it's got a bit of history, and I do have to research that history before I make the video. I a uh, close-up video of this. All right, last up, I think you might know what it's going to be, but it, this is one mean blade that was made just for me, and that is my Hogtooth Knives Loveless Subhilt Fighter. Wearing the absolutely gorgeous uh, corset, I think it looks like a corset, corseted sheath made by uh, Matt Chase of Hogtooth Knives. He does his leather as well as he does his blades, I got to say. Um, here's the knife. One of my favorite all-time patterns, uh, the Loveless Subhilt Fighter is a long and slender eight, seven to eight to nine inch uh, clip point blade with both edges fully sharpened all the way up to the Ricasso. Uh, in this case, this uh, that's 1095 and 15 and 20 um, forged together to make this really cool Damascus pattern. Let me see how we can get close on it. Um, but there, there you go. You can see all the swirls. Very, very cool steel and pattern. The, these are hollow ground edges or bevels. The edges are incredibly sharp. Um, <clears throat> and then you come to the handle and you've got a sub hilt. Now the sub hilt is you've got this hilt here uh, and it's asymmetrical, which I like. And um, but this is the sub hilt and the sub hilt is acts like a trigger. You can use it like this for for uh, snappy kind of cutting, but really it's it's there for drawing out the knife. Say uh, this is definitely a fighting knife, and say it's in, you know, stuck in something. Uh, that sub hilt helps you pull it out. So I mean, it, it keeps it in your hand. Yes, it it's good for retention. Yes, but it's also good for manipulating the knife and hand. Um, those. Quillions and that sub hilt are made from uh, reclaimed steel from the Longfellow Bridge in Boston. And then this right here is a beautiful, beautiful piece of stag. Um, just a, this is the knife I've declared I would, if I were ever called out on a duel, this would be my dueling knife. So um, that's what I'm going to call it. That's my dueling knife. And that's where I'm going to leave it. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Um, Please check in with the show this weekend for a great uh, interview. Of course, uh, tomorrow night, when uh, Thursday Night Knives, I almost called it Wednesday, Thursday Night Knives, be sure to check in uh, and join us and join the conversation. Uh, Sunday, we have Dan Eastland, episode 336. Uh, what a great guy. We have a great conversation about uh, his foray into knife making and his story. He's got an interesting story and beautiful blades. All right, that's it for me and for Jim working his magic behind the switcher. I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.